I would like to address you today on the topic of the family. Because as you know, the family is on the general attack all over the world, on the world powers. It is not, we have not to seek proofs for this, this is too evident. And as, as you may know, the famous a quotation of a letter of Sister Lucia Fatima, which she wrote to the late Cardinal Caffara, that Our Lady told her that the final battle between Christ and Satan will be on marriage and family. And so we are already, I, I think, in the middle of the battle. But we have to have the conviction and that we are already in the team of the winners in this battle because the boss of our team is Christ and he is the winner and so but we have to fight also <laughs> so maybe first I present you some some reflections on the family and then I will share with you some my experience in the time of Soviet Union and family Uh, one of the most important tasks of the family is to give to the children a good religious Catholic education, <coughs> uh, the education in faith. So the catechism should start in family. This is the first catechism classes. So this I experienced in my life. And also the popes and the magisterium oftentimes stress this, the importance of uh, the religious knowledge, the good religious knowledge. And so Pope Pius X rightly observed, uh, saying that the enemy has indeed long been prowling about the fault and attacking it with such subtle cunning that now, more than ever before, the prediction of the Apostle to the elders of the Church of Ephesus seems to be verified. St. Paul said, I know that fierce wolves will get in among you and will not spare the flock. Those who still are zealous for the glory of God are seeking the causes and the reasons for this decline in religion. Coming to a different explanation, each points out, according to his own view, a different plan for the protection and restoration of the kingdom of God on earth. But it seems to us that while we should not overlook other considerations, we are forced to agree with those who hold that the chief cause of the present indifference and, as it were, infirmity of soul and the serious evils that result from it is to be found above all in ignorance, in things divine. This is fully in accord with what God himself declared through the prophet Hosea saying, and there is no knowledge of God in the land. And Pope Benedict XIV wrote already in the 18th century, we declare that a great number of those who are condemned to eternal punishment suffer that everlasting calamity because of culpable ignorance of the mysteries of faith which must be known and believed in order to be numbered among the elect. For this reason, the same Pope, Benedict XIV, said there is nothing more effective than catechetical instruction to spread the glory of God and to secure the salvation of souls. And so the beauty and the mission of the Catholic family on, um, 
is manifested and manifests itself in a special manner also in large families. We possess one of the most striking and illuminating affirmations of the Magisterium on this theme in the following words of Pope Pius XII addressed to the associations of large families. I quote Pius XII. Large families are the most splendid flower beds in the garden of the church. The brows of the fathers and mothers may be burdened with cares, but there is never a trace of that inner shadow that betrays anxiety of conscience or fear of an irreparable return to loneliness. Their youth never seems to fade away as long as the sweet fragrance of a crib remains in the home. As long as the walls of the house echo to the silvery voices of children and grandchildren. Their heavy labors multiplied many times over, their redoubled sacrifices and their renunciation of costly amusements are generously rewarded even here below by the inexhaustible treasury of affection and tender hopes that dwell in their hearts without ever tiring them or bothering them. And the hopes soon become a reality when the eldest daughter begins to help her mother to take care of the baby. And on the day the oldest son comes home with his face beaming with the first salary he has earned himself. Children in a large family learn almost automatically to be careful of what they do and to assume responsibility. For them the family is a little prowling ground before they move into the world outside. So the words of Pope Pius XII. We know that the Church already spoke several times this truth that the family is the first seminary in the process of fostering and training priestly vocations. This, this is written in the, in the decree of Vatican Council, of the Second Vatican Council, and in the decree of Tatum Totius. And history has given proof that the majority of priestly vocations come from large families. A as a rule, mm -hmm. there are exceptions, of course. Pope Pius XII highlight highlighted this interrelationship, saying, with good reason, it has often been pointed out that large families have been in the forefront as the cradles of saints. We might cite, among others, the family of St. <coughs> Louis, the King of France, made up of ten children. <coughs> That's St. Catherine of Siena, who came from a family of 25. <coughs> St. Robert Bellarmine, from a family of 12. St. Pius X, from a family of 10. And so, I, I remember when I, a couple of years ago, I participated in the World Family Meeting in, in uh, Milano, in Italy. And so, uh, and close to me was a bishop from Argentina. And we spoke and I asked him, so how many siblings do you have in your family? How many children you were? And he said, we are 21. And my mother is still alive, <laughs> in good condition, <laughs> 92 year old, in good condition, 21 children from the same parents. And from these 21, two are bishops, <laughs> three priests, five religious sisters. And he himself has ordained his elder brother bishop. 
So, uh, when I was telling this story, I was last July in Fatima for the jubilee of the centenary of F Fatima, and I gave a talk also on family in a group, and I told this story of this bishop with 21 children in the family, and a lady after my talk raised her hand and said very calmly and modestly, I am a mother of 18. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And she was, had so, so a nice face. She had very young, even 18 children, and she were very beautiful still. So, it's only uh, a remark to this. And so the supernatural spirit of love and self-sacrifice of the mother, and oftentimes of the mother of a large family, is the very foundation often of a priestly vocation and of the fruitfulness of the priestly life of her son. The following moving example illustrates this truth in an impressive manner. In the city of Zaboże in Upper Silesia in Poland is a grave which is frequently visited by pilgrims. Above the grave rises a Lourdes grotto. At the foot of the statue of the Immaculate Conception, in a little glass case, lies a myrtle frieze. Here is the story of this myrtle frieze. A priest is buried in the grave at the foot of the grotto. He was the youngest of ten children. As a young man, he worked <coughs> very hard to earn enough money to study for the priesthood because his parents were poor. After his ordination, he went as a missionary to India, where he worked for many years. When he died, they buried him in his home town of Zaboje and erected a grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes above his tomb because he had always fostered a special devotion to Mary Immaculate. Some time after the burial of the zealous priest, a little box was found among his possessions in his house with a note pasted upon it. And this was the note, to be opened after my death. The box contained a myrtle wreath and this note, this is my mother's bridal wreath. I have carried it with me to various countries on my journeys over land and sea in memory of that sacred moment when my mother vowed not only fidelity but also uprightness, rightness at the altar of God. She has kept that vow. She has had the courage to have me after the ninth child. Next to God, I owe her my life and my vocation to the priesthood. If she had not wanted me, I would not have become a priest and a missionary. I would not have been able to work for the salvation of souls. Please, place this wreath, my mother's bridal wreath, into my grave. This I ask of the one who finds it. When they found the wreath, the grave had already been closed. So they placed it at the foot of the statue of the Immaculate Mother. So it's a beautiful witness. Another example, we could mention the mother of St. Pius X, Margarita Sanson. She raised up ten children. She taught them to pray first thing in the morning, then communicate with God throughout the day, and to end each day with prayer, bringing the family together for an examination of conscience every evening. The well-known story of the wedding ring of his mother remains always inspiring. Following her son's episcopal ordination, and his placement in the Diocese of Mantova, the future Pope Pius X visited his old mother to thank her. 
after kissing his episcopal ring, she showed him her wedding ring and said, your ring is very beautiful, Giuseppe, but you would not have it if I did not wear this my ring. <laughs> and so, my dear brothers and sisters, it is so important that we ask and pray and work in the church today for the true renewal of the church. But we have, we have to start with the families, with good families. And also our example is St. Therese of Child Jesus, when she wrote in her biography, The, the History of a Soul, her memories of the Sundays. The most beautiful day, she wrote, was the Sunday, because it was the day of the Lord. And all went to Mass, to the Holy Mass in those times. And the Mass was celebrated in Latin in those times, in 19th century. And, but when the priest started to preach, she was very attentive. But he, her father already canonized St. Louis Martin. He was very touched by the, by the homilies of the priest, and oftentimes he was weeping, crying. And she was looking upon her father. And so she was so attentive. And she never forgets the active participation of her father in liturgy. And herself even, they did not understand Latin, but they very much actively participated in liturgy, even to be moved uh, to tears. So today, oftentimes we hear active participation in liturgy by the lay people, but I would I would wonder if they are moved to tears when they participate actively, or it is more action. True participation, active, is to be touched by God, by the grace in your soul. And this. The Catholic family is the original place of the experience of the beauty of the Catholic faith. The Catholic family represents the first bulwark against the current great apostasy. The two most efficient weapons against the modern apostasy, outside and inside the Church, are the purity and integrity of faith and the purity of a chaste life, according to your state of life. We have to observe all the chastity. The admonition which St. Louis the Ninth, King of France, left to his son remains always valid. I quote, he wrote, my dearest son, my first instruction is that you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength. Without this, there is no salvation. Keep yourself, my son, from everything that you know displeases God. That is to say, keep you from every mortal sin. You should permit yourself to be tormented by every kind of martyrdom before you would allow yourself to commit a mortal sin. Work to remove all sin from your land, particularly blasphemies and heresies. So this was the, the testament of the Saint King Louis to his son. Once a member of an anti-Christian movement, who later converted to the Catholic faith, said to Father Matteo Crowley 
the apostle of the enthronement of the Sacred Heart the following. Witness. We have only one goal in mind, this anti-Christian movement. That is to de-Christianize the family. We leave to the Catholics gladly the churches, the buildings, the chapels, the, the cathedrals. For us, it is enough to have the family in order to corrupt society. If we have control over the family, our victory over the, over the church is guaranteed. This was, this was a testimony of this um, converted uh, member of an anti-Christian movement which he gave to this priest. And so, through Catholic, true Catholic families and desir desirably large families, will strengthen the church you know, of our days with the beauty of the Catholic faith. From that faith will come out new Catholic fathers, mothers, and from them there will come out a new generation of zealous priests and also bishops who will be ready to give their life for Christ and for the salvation of the souls. The Christianity was born out of the family, the Holy Family, so that the family may be born again out of the Christianity. The first fruit of the redemption is the Holy Family, just as the first blessing of the Creator was given to the family in, already in Paradise. Indeed, what the current world and the Church mostly need are true Catholic families, the original places of the beauty of the Catholic faith. So, and as your bishop asked me to share something of my experience of the life, so I was born in the Soviet Union, in the Kyrgyzstan, Republic, it is on the, on the border with China, in a German family, a very Catholic family. And so my ancestors, my parents, they were, grow up in German villages close to the town Odessa in the Ukraine, in the, in the actual Ukraine, on the Black Sea shore. There were a lot of German villages, completely German, separated from others. And even they were separated according to the Catholics or Lutherans, so, and they came originally, my, my ancestors from Alsace-Lorraine region, uh, Germans from the, this region in the beginning of the 19th century, there was a migration there. And thanks be to God, they kept the Catholic faith, they had their own priests and churches in these villages. And um, after the war, Stalin, uh, deported all these people to different places. But already before the war, Stalin started a terror, a uh, persecution of his own people. I mean, you know that even today Russia ag acknowledges that under Stalin died, Stalin killed his own people, not, not uh, other people. 20 million. 20 million inhabitants of Soviet Union, of course of different nations. This is greater than the Holocaust. And no one speaks about this, but this is true. Well, and so my grandfather, from the father's side, was a victim of this terror in, in 37, in the year 937, and it was completely arbitrary. Uh, they, when someone had some land, and my grandfather had some land, and was, relig uh, was good Catholic, and had possessions, it was already, he was already condemned to death. This was already. Even my grandfather was ready to, to give away the land. No, he was already on the list to be killed. And so, 
when he was only 27 years old, a young man, and my father was a little child. My grandmother was 25. He was in the night. He was taken away and um, with other men, and they were shot down and killed. And so my grandmother remained a widow with 25 years, with two little children. And she lived 74 years as a widow, until 99. And I could uh, bury her in, in Germany when she was 99. And, and this my grandmother, thanks be to God, she kept the Catholic faith very strong. After the, the murder of my grandfather, the police came to check the house. And in those times, it was a very furious atheism uh, period. So there could not be any signs of Christianity. It was there forbidden, even in the houses. And But my mother, my grandmother, had full of sacred pictures on the walls. She was very pious. And so the police came in and saw all these beautiful pictures, holy pictures, and they said, this is forbidden. We are living in an in a atheist time. You have to take off these pictures from the wall. And my grandmother refused. No, I will not do this. <coughs> and then the police himself, policeman, went to the wall and wanted to take off the, himself. And in this moment, my grandmother shouted on him. You have not put the, the picture here, the, the, and you have not the right to take this away. So, and, and he was shocked, because in those terror times, all people were afraid of police, because they could shout, uh, uh, shut them to death. And in this moment, my grandmother had a supernatural courage. She was usually a very modest and calm lady, and uh, timid. But in this moment, she had a courage, an extraordinary. She shouted to the police. And, and this was also, and he was shocked and did, did nothing and went away. And they left her and no one touched her. And so I consider this as a, a miracle, a protection of God. And then after some time, the, the communists they made a kolkhoz system there that all the people had to work on Sunday in the field. And my, ma my grandmother refused, no, I will not work in the field on Sunday, it is the day of the Lord. And the chief of this political uh, community there uh, uh, ordered her, you have to work there. And then my, my grandmother answered him, you can kill me, I will not work on Sundays. And they left her in peace. <laughs> and no one touched her. So it is a miracle, I mean, that God protects them. And I am so grateful that I, I received the Catholic faith as to save his mother's milk. Already from my grandparents, from both sides, were profoundly pious from both sides, grand and grand-grandparents, so I know them. And then my, my parents also, both. And this is for me the greatest gift which I consider in my life, that I, I got the Catholic faith with mother's milk and was educated in the family, the Catholic faith. I consider this greater than the priesthood and the episcopacy. The Catholic faith, the pure Catholic faith, which I received as a child. It is for me, every day I, I thank God for this, and every day I am becoming older, I recognize the more the importance of the Catholic faith, of the pure Catholic faith. Of the, so, so my mother was the first catechist for, for us. We were four children. She was our catechist. She taught us the good old German catechism <coughs> from the 19th century. But it is the same faith. 
of the apostles, <coughs> the same faith cannot change the catechisms. No. And, uh, and she was my teacher of First Holy Communion. And so, and when we lived in Kyrgyzstan, there were, there were no priests, because the most of the priests were imprisoned or exiled. And so we lived without priests. But, and so, <coughs> when I was born, I was the youngest child in, in the family, there were, no, there were no priests. And uh, nobody knew when will come the priest, maybe in one year or in two years. It was only occasionally. And so, when I was born, my mother decided herself to baptize me. She could not wait uh, so much so time without baptizing the child. And so she took a German prayer book where it was written the, uh, the baptism, took water. I was one, I was seven days old, one week old. And my father, in the presence of my father, and so she started the ceremony of baptism, baptizing me with water and so. And when she finished, she looked upon my father and asked him, did I correctly this? And he answered, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, well, I will repeat <laughs> when you don't know. <laughs> so, and so she repeated a second time, baptized me, and then she was sure that I am baptized. And after six months, there came occasionally a clandestine priest from Lithuania, uh, a Jesuit priest. It was completely secret. And there were a lot of Germans in this part of the town. And he said to the German mothers, uh, all the children who were not baptized by a priest, you have to bring to me. I don't trust to the baptisms of and so my mother brought me to him, and he baptized me the third time. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm three times baptized. <laughs> I have no doubts about the validity of my baptism, at least. <laughs> and so, and in, and my, one of the most beautiful records, memories of my <coughs> childhood in Kyrgyzstan, were the, the, the Sundays. We had no priests, but uh, our, and we, we could not gather with other people, it was forbidden. So my parents and we children, we made on Sunday morning our Sunday worship, I mean, in the family. It was really a domestic church. I experienced this, a domestic church. We knelt, we, we closed the doors and, and the windows, and then we knelt down all together father, mother, and we four children, and started to pray. The rosary, the litany, and then we made a spiritual communion. My mother said, now we will unite ourselves with a mass, which is maybe to now celebrated in one in, in part of the world, and asked our Lord to come to us spiritually. And we received so much graces, so many graces. With this, even we lived a couple of years without priests. But we kept the, the truth of the faith, the beauty of the faith. We received uh, graces through the spiritual communions. We made contrition, act of contrition, uh, to repent our sins. And so, even you know that now there is a <coughs> going on a process of unfortunately, uh, to make, uh, to introduce in the Catholic Church uh, the ordination of a married man. Even there will be probably next, next year a synod on the Amazonia, because there are no, there are very, a shortage of priests to ordain there some exceptional cases, some married priests. But it is a wrong decision completely. We kept our faith in the Soviet Union, living a lot of, many years without priests. But we kept the faith. And then when they came the priest, once a year or every second year, it was a feast. 
Yeah, really. And so, so I consider the arguments <coughs> to introduce married priesthood completely without fundament. Even so, it is contrary to the entire apostolic tradition. Apostolic tradition. It is not only canon law. It is apostolic tradition. The Church has no right, to my opinion, to change this. Even so, it's not a dogma of faith, but it is apostolic tradition. It's not pure canon law. And to my opinion, the Pope has no authority to change the celibacy of the priesthood. I hope that the Lord will not permit this. But, well, this only, uh, I, I mention this because of the team, we had no priest there. And so, and one another record, the, the, um, the Christmas. So Christmas, we had no priest. Christmas Day, we had to work, to go to school. There was, there was an atheist country. But on the eve of Christmas, my parents uh, gathered the Germans in our house there and made uh, yes, a worship or, well, pr praying and singing and so to, to celebrate Christmas. It was forbidden. But across the road, there was, there was lived the chief police of the city, <laughs> a Russian. And he was the best friend of our family. Yes, we loved him so much. We, we considered him our uncle uh, and so. And he was a good friend of my father and my mother. His, his name was Anatoly. And then on the eve, uh, my father said to him, you know, we are Catholics. We have to celebrate Christmas this night. So we have together, I have together people and to ce make a celebration. And then he said to my father, so I will guarantee you this night there will, there will not come no policeman to you. I will guarantee this. And so he protected us so that we could celebrate in the night, even illegally, uh, the Christmas. And so this was a beautiful record of my childhood. I remember these Christmas nights. It was crowded, all the house. And we were praying, all in German language, of course, and singing the beautiful German Christmas songs. And then we moved from um, Kyrgyzstan, from Central Asia, to Estonia in the Baltic states in order to better to emigrate to Germany. It was, this was the plan of my father. And when we came to Estonia, the first thing, my, my parents started to travel all around Estonia to seek a church. And they found a church, a Catholic church, an old. He, uh, this church was still open. The government allowed this, and there was a priest and this was more or less 70 miles from our town where we lived in Estonia. And when they came home, they said to us children, Oh, children, we've, we found a church, a Catholic church. And imagine, so close, only 70 miles. <laughs> Beautiful, so close. We were so happy to have a church so close, 70 miles only. And then we traveled on Sundays to the Mass. And these, these, these journeys, we traveled by, by train to the Mass, to Sunday Mass, were all also one of the most beautiful memories of my childhood. And there I received my first Holy Communion in this church. And there was a holy priest, a Capuchin priest from Lat L L Latvia or Lettonia. What is in English? Latvia? Latvia. 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 From Latvia. A holy man. And since our family we had to travel the farthest distance, all the other families were, were close to the church. And we had to wait four hours in the railway station for the next train after Mass. And so, therefore, we could go to his, uh, his apartment. He was a little room only. He had no more. And spend there some hours. Uh, only our family so there. Yeah. And there was the church, and there was the house, and a little way uh, to the house where the priest had his, his room. And so always after Mass we went this. 
And I remember once, since I was the youngest child, I went with my mother. I wa maybe I had nine year. I was nine year old or ten year, maybe nine or ten. And uh, and I was so impressed of the priest, who irradiated for me holiness. This priest, and he was before he was in the camp of concentration and in prison, and so he was a holy man. And I was so impressed as a boy of this man that he, he irradiated a holiness for me. And in this age of nine or ten, I had not yet the idea or the uh, desire to become a priest. But this man impressed me. And so we were walking. I was walking with my mother. And suddenly I stopped and asked only out of curiosity, Mother, how one can become a priest? only out of curiosity. And then my mother stopped. We spoke always in German together. He, she stopped and said to me these words, in order to become a priest, it is necessary that God calls. That God call. And I did not understand. God call. Then I looked on the heaven and I'm, I was thinking that now will come a voice to my ear to call <laughs> me in my childish mind. And there came no voice from heaven. And it was so strange for me. God has to call. And then I did not understand this. And I never asked my mother and no other person how to become a priest. <laughs> but I became a priest. <laughs> I spoke with no one in my life how to become a priest about this. Mm. But then when we moved to Germany by a miracle of Our Lady on the 13th of October, Fatima Day in 73, we came to Germany and in the Soviet Union the children had not, uh, were not permitted to be altar boys to serve Mass, only adult persons <laughs> could serve. And so I, I could not serve Mass because it was forbidden. And when we came to Germany, I started to serve Mass. I was 12 and a half year old. And after my first serving the Mass, I was feeling in my soul, I have to become a priest. And in this moment, before my eyes, was the, this priest, this holy priest. It was not a vision, but it was a very uh, living uh, experience. I had before my eyes this holy priest, <coughs> his faith. And so, and then I, I was, I had the conviction but from this moment, I have to become a priest. And therefore, I had not a need to speak with no one how to become a priest. <laughs> because I had the, in the conviction in my soul. <coughs> and this priest was always before my eyes, this holy priest. Uh, Father Yanis Pavlovskis, he was his name. And when we, when we said farewell to him to go to Germany, he, he told us these words. I simply repeat this. I will not scandalize no one of you or those who will hear. He's, he's, he, he told us this. When you will come to Germany, be attention. There are some churches where Holy Communion is giving on the hand. Please do not go to these churches. <coughs> and my mother and my father, and we, hear, we heard this for the first time in our life. And the reaction of my parents was horrible. This was the instantaneous reaction of my mother and father. Horrible, impossible to take our Lord in hand. And even a I as a child, for me was this so strange because I was educated to such a, a reverence as a child already to the Holy Communion host. It was for me as a child, that is my God, really. So I was, by my mother told, uh, taught me and this Holy Priest, it is Jesus there, it is God. So I cannot take this as common food. 
And so, when we came to Germany, in a little town, it's a Catholic town, with three Catholic churches, we went first uh, Sunday to the Mass, and we observed with horror <laughs> that all people took, already in those times, in hand. And very quickly, uh, the communion was given in a row, I mean in a queue, like in a cafeteria, uh, very quickly. We were, we were shocked. Mm -hmm. And then when we went and came ha home, my mother said, we will never go to this church. No. Next church, the same situation. And then only rested one church. And we went in the third Sunday to there, and the same situation. And when we came home, when we came home, my mother looked upon us, children, and started to weep. I said, oh my children, I cannot understand how one can treat our Lord in this manner. And she wept. And this, is, it, this experience was so deep for me. And this is the, the remote cause, the reason why I wrote these two books about Holy Communion, maybe one of you know this book, Dominus Est, it is the Lord, and the Corpus Christi. This experience, the words of my holy parish priest in Estonia, and, and this experience which we had. So, but nevertheless, we kept the faith. We did not allow us to be contaminated with this liberal staff there when we came. And with the grace of God, uh, we gave, we continued, our family, uh, to give witness to the Catholic faith. And we always received kneeling under the tongue. We were the only one family in the entire church. But the, the parish priest they gave us because they had, we had some privilege because we came from a, a persecuted church, from the clandestine church. They could not humiliate us and refuse us the communion uh, or kneeling under the tongue. So we had some privilege, some protection. <laughs> well, and so my dear brothers and sisters, I would like to encourage all of you to, to be faithful to the Catholic Church, to the true catechism, to the deep veneration of our Lord in the Holy Communion, and to do all what we can, the priests and others, the catechists to prepare good young families, large families. And this is the, the greatest power of the renewal of the church. Thank you for your attention.